This is the Russian dynamite Masha Slamovich. Becca here. This is not America's sweetheart Davian. It's Billy Starks and the super fly guy Trayvon Jordan. This is the fly side fly Jalen Brandon. Hardcore princess Jules Malone. Hi there, this is the bubblegum princess Alexia Nicole. This is the Brazilian Wonder Woman Christy Jane. This is the baddest black belt Chennai Kai. This is Kid Bandit. The smash hit Joel Bateman. This is Robin Renegade. Cody Hawk. Brutal Bob Evans. And you are listening to Wrestling With Entertainment, one of my favorite podcasts in the whole wide world. Hey everybody, this is Pete Rosado, the owner and lead commentator of We Are Wrestling in the Bronx, New York, and you're listening to Wrestling With Entertainment. Hello, 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 and welcome to the show. It's Wrestling With Entertainment, the only audio experience on the web today. The trusted choice for them to be all your favorite wrestlers every Tuesday and Wednesday on YouTube. Castbox, sponsored by Rogue Energy and Playout One Coffee. I am, of course, your host, James J., alongside Scooter Dust. Men with feet firmly planted in the ground have trouble putting on pants. And it is a great day for wrestling, because we are wrestling with... The owner of We Are Wrestling, the voice of a generation, Pete <laughs> Rosado. Listen, I, uh, I myself also have trouble putting on pants most days, <laughs> and I swear it's the pants' fault, not mine. What are pants? Uh. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say that too loud. I wouldn't, you know, out here in New York, what are pants? You know, that's a that a question that got to get you locked up. How are you, Pete? Oh, I'm doing a, I'm doing good. A little cold, a little cold. It's been, it's been cold here in New York and New Jersey, uh, you know. And I've been out in the streets, kind of getting ready for our, uh, our upcoming events, um, going out there and promoting and doing stuff, and as well just living a regular life, work and everything. So uh, this cold is catching up to us. And New York uh, finally got snow this month. We hadn't had snow in a pretty long time, at least a substantial snowfall. So uh, getting some snow. Uh, was was a welcome sight this month. Hell yeah. And, uh, I mean, obviously things are heating up um, in just a few days. Um, I believe it's on um, this February 2nd? Yeah, February 2nd. Uh, don't call it a comeback. We Are Wrestling returns to the Bronx, New York at St. Helena's Church. Uh, you know, it, it's always a pleasure to be in the Bronx, when we started We Are Wrestling, that was one of the things that was really missing. That was the missing piece. Uh, back in 2021, we uh, we started in Jersey. We ran in Ridgefield Park, and we are eternally grateful to Ridgefield Park and uh, and, and Steve Off, the owner of Pro Wrestling Magic, uh, obviously uh, uh, supplied us with our ring and you know helped us get you know access to the building. There, and we're eternally grateful to them for giving us a place to start. But there was always something missing. As great as those shows were, our first three, there was something missing, and it was just it wasn't home. And home to me has always been the Bronx. And there's uh, a, a, a very big gap. There's no wrestling in the Bronx now. You got a couple of places that are kind of doing some things. I know there's a small school in the North Bronx, a WWX, that does some like in-house shows and some things, and they've got a little training facility going on, and they're 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 really up and coming. But in terms of like having these full-scale, high-quality, uh, independent wrestling shows. Uh, the Bronx hasn't really seen that in a while, right? The last time that was really happening uh, was back in the days of before the pandemic with uh, BWF, Bronx Wrestling Federation. They ran every month on Saturdays um, when Battle Club Pro, uh, who now operates out of uh, Brooklyn and Queens, when they first started, they, they ran out of the Bronx um, cause the, the owner at the time, Carlos, he was a, a Bronx, a Bronx kid of the Bronx, I should say. Um, and so wanted to do the same thing, bring great professional wrestling, uh, back to the Bronx. And once we moved to the Bronx, everything kind of just clicked, everything just changed for us. And it's been really, really great. So, uh, happy to come back. We were supposed to come back in December. Initially, this show was scheduled to happen December 1st. Hmm. Um, but we found out that, uh, WWE SmackDown was going to emanate from the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York on Friday, December 1st. And uh, who am I 
to try to run a show <laughs> on the same night as Friday Night SmackDown. <laughs> um, so we decided to kind of push back a little bit. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to secure any dates with St. Helena's in January. And so I just said, okay, you know what, we'll just, we'll just do February 2nd, which was the first available date we were able to get. And, uh, like, let's just do it all, all gas, no brakes and, and make it happen. Oh yeah. And, um, for anybody that, um, can't make it to the show, how can we watch, um, don't call it a comeback. So we are currently uh, located on Title Match Network. So you can go to titlematchnetwork.com and sign up for a subscription there. It's $9.99 a month. I love that number, right? Brings back some really great memories. Um, $9.99 a month. And if you, if you sign up for a month, you get a week free. Um, so you're really only paying about three, $3.33 a week for three weeks. You're getting a week for free. Um, and if you sign up for a year, 12 months, you're actually paying $99.99 a year. So you're actually really, if you think about it, 10 bucks a month with two months free, if you think about it like that, because 100 bucks at 10 bucks a month would get you 10 months, and then you're getting two months free. Um, so you can sign up for Title Match. You can see everything that's on Title Match, including some uh, New York, New Jersey promotions like Battle Club Pro, like Bree Combination Wrestling, and We Are Wrestling as well, as well as Things like old episodes, uh, old shows of WrestleCade or AML Wrestling located in North Carolina. Um, I know that Mission Pro Wrestling, the uh, uh, wrestling company run by Thunder Rosa, is housed on Title Match Network and a lot of other great promotions as well. You can catch all of the We Are Wrestling library, all the shows prior to this one there, and you can catch it live on February 2nd on Title Match. We will be streaming live that night. So if you want to sign up to watch that show, that would be the place to do it. And, of course, uh, social media. Oh, yeah. So definitely right now on Instagram, uh, we, we are wrestling one. So one word, we are wrestling and the number one. Uh, if you go to Twitter, it is wrestling underscore we. And then myself, uh, you can catch me on Twitter as my own at Pete Rosado 87. Uh, the We Are Wrestling account, obviously, a little bit more active than mine. Uh, I kind of abandoned my own Twitter sometimes in, in, in favor of the We Are Wrestling Twitter. Right. And uh, you don't have to go looking for it. All of the links to all of uh, We Are Wrestling social media will be in the description of the video below, but on YouTube and CastBox. Right. Um, let's get into it. Um, your, uh, your North, your first devil and current grand champion is Rob Kiljoy. Um, can you tell us about why Rob Kiljoy was the right guy to put the belt on first? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we put the belt on on anyone. Rob Kiljoy definitely earned that title. Uh, at there can only be one or a one night title tournament. I mean, Without he that. went in there and had to, yeah, he he had to get through three matches to to earn that championship. That final match against the All Father Darius Carter, uh, a man who is currently really blowing up on the independent scene, um, and and it's long due for Mister Darius Carter, so be it. But a man he'd lost previously to. Uh, just a couple of months prior at We Are Wrestling, lost a singles match to Darius Carter, straight up, uh, but yet was able to, to find a way to, to win that night. And this was after having a hellacious semifinals match against a Northeast legend, a Ring of Honor original in Dan Moff. And anybody oh, in New York... Yeah, anybody in New York knows that name. And, you know, yeah. Sco Scooter Dust, when I said it, knew exactly who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dan Moff is not someone to be taken lightly. And the fact that Rob Kiljoy not only survived Dan Moff, but then literally less than an hour later had to wrestle again one more time for that grand championship, it says a lot. But when, when you think of Rob Kiljoy, what he represents as the We Are Wrestling Grand Champion, he represents – 
a fighting champion. He represents a traveling champion. This is a man who has gone from being a singles wrestler to being a trios wrestler to being a tag team wrestler to once again, due to no circumstances of his own, once again going back to singles wrestling, uh, still dabbling in tag team wrestling, and has really knocked it out the park with every opportunity. This is a man, one of the founding members of the Ugly Ducklings, a, 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 a original trio with Colby Carino and Lance Lude uh, and, and their, their coach, Coach Mikey, making the town, going north, south, east, west. I mean, these, these men were doing it all. And then Colby Carino took some time off from wrestling, and it became a tag team. It became just Lance Lude and Rob Kiljoy. And the Ugly Ducklings, that motor just kept going. I mean, there were nights they were everywhere. There were nights they would come up. When I first met them, ran into them, they would be coming up to New York. They'd be wrestling in New Jersey to drive that same night down to Georgia. The next day, they'd wrestle in Georgia to drive up the next day on a Sunday to wrestle in Chicago to come all the way back to the Carolinas to come home. And this was three nights, and they were just driving and hitting the roads. And then... Lance Lude, unfortunately, had his battle uh, with cancer, right. which Lance Lude was able to, to, to beat, and we were all in, in Lance's corner quacking it up. But Rob Kiljoy had to be a singles guy again, and he had to go and make a name for himself. And when you are a successful tag team wrestler, there's a lot of people that maybe don't believe you have what it takes to be as successful as a singles wrestler. And in Rob Kiljoy, I mean, did he he burst through every ceiling you gave him, every expectation. It doesn't matter what match you put him in, what kind of opponent you put him in there against. He's been great, and he knocks it out the park every single time. I remember our first show, our debut show, uh, you know, want to be starting something all the way back in August of 2021. Rob Kiljoy was initially scheduled to be part of a six-way scramble match, which has become a a staple of what we do at We Are Wrestling. And literally about two or three weeks before the show, I got contacted by Anthony Green, who had about a month prior to that left NXT and started hitting the independent seat again. And AG and I... We go, we go back, you know, when he was first starting out and, you know, we crossed paths and worked together before. And he said, hey, you know, do you have any open spots on the show? I'd love to come in and work for you. And I was just like, you know, we, we really don't, but I can see what I can do. Uh, and I was like, you know, who would you, who would you want to wrestle? And literally the first message he sent back to me, he was just like, what's Rob Killjoy doing? <laughs> And I was just like, well, he's in a scramble match. So uh, I guess I can rearrange that. He's like, give me Rob Killjoy. Oh, and yeah. I was like, all right. And uh, three weeks before the show, it's it's now Rob Killjoy getting pulled out of a scramble match to Rob Killjoy being put into a one-on-one match against Anthony Green fresh out of NXT, right? Um, and they absolutely killed it in a co-main event uh, that night. And it was, it was one of the best matches I'd seen in a while. Um, I mean, AG always knocks it out of the park. And Rob Kiljoy just once again taking it to just another level. Uh, the next show, he was in a, a scramble, a four-way match against names like Casey Navarro, um, Smiley, Brother Greatness, all great Northeast talents, and Casey Navarro making his name all around the independents. Um, and he kept going from there. The very next show, he fought Jay Lethal. Yeah, you know, in a great match that you can see on title match, Jay Lethal, AEW star, Ring of Honor legend, uh, J- Jersey All Pro Wrestling, mm. you know, all of it, and you going up against Rob Kiljoy in that match, and and I remember looking into going into the locker room at the end of the show, and Jay Lethal standing there with Rob Kiljoy, uh, just to pull back the curtain a little bit, and he was just like giving him all this praise on on what a fantastic match. And things like that. And, and this goes to tell you something. Rob Kildroy has been in the business close to 20 years at this point, in my, in my estimation. That man was ringside early in the show doing whatever it was that 
Jay Lethal was leading people through because earlier that day, Jay Lethal ran a seminar for us in that building. And Rob Kiljoy, all of 17 plus years of experience, was actually taking the seminar. Came to me and said, hey, I'll pay to be part of the seminar. I'm like, are you crazy? Go ahead, just go. You know, but not only is like, the man still wants to learn. He still wants to get better. There is no complacency. There is no resting on his laurels. There is no resting on the resume. Um, and, and with that, he's been a fighting champion. I mean, he's taken that title since he's won it, and he's defended it in multiple states, in multiple promotions. In fact, literally this past weekend, uh, defended, at res- at, at, defended it at Resolute Wrestling. And, and, you know, this is a man who could literally, on any given night, lose that championship, but decide, I'm going to be a fighting champion no matter where I am. Uh, and I believe we're up to about 10 title defenses around the country for Rob Kiljoy outside of We Are Wrestling. Oh, yeah. And shout wow. out to Rob, um, friend of the show. We've interviewed him yes. uh, quite some time ago. All right. Um, Scooter, you have a, a question. Yes. Uh, I have to give it a little context. Um, so, 2010 is uh, when I started my training. I started with the uh, with the New York Wrestling Connection out in Deer Park. Okay, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, trained by Mikey Whipwreck, Pat Buck, yeah, Tony Nice. With you would always get visits from uh, yeah, Brian uh, Brian Myers and Matt Cardona. Uh, and this was and this was before Creator Pro opened up. Yes, yes. Uh, so. You know, I would, I would take my bumps and everything, and, but our ring announcer at the time was Larry Legend, somebody you know uh, quite well, somebody I know quite well. Larry and I were the uh, ring announcer timekeeper team until about a couple of months when uh, announcing fell on me after uh, Larry took a little bit of a sabbatical. And then that lasted until uh, Josh Daniels uh, kicked the crap out of me uh, and was going to be some sort of push. That never happened uh, due to an injury. But I want to uh, revisit Larry Legend. Uh, Of course, he's one of the names under your notable commentary partners. Tell us about your experience or experiences with Larry Legend. Oh man, um, listen. I know. Just, just full, full disclosure. I, I know Larry. You know, unfortunately, landed himself uh, in a little bit of, of, of negative controversy and in wrestling Twitter and in the wrestling circles uh, for some things that happened on a on a different podcast. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to speak on the Larry Legend that I worked with, the Larry mm-hmm. Legend that I knew. Yes. Uh, the Larry legend that I've interacted with. Um, you know, Larry Larry was nothing but uh, nice to me, nothing but giving. Um, Larry gave me a lot of uh, insight into how to become better. You know, my, my number one passion in this business, and it's still the thing that I do to this day, it's the thing I actually love more than promoting uh, a company is, is doing commentary. Uh, that's that's my main thing, um, and uh, you know Larry was the one who you know he taught me how to how to not lose my voice. Larry taught me how to you know how to save my voice throughout a show. Larry put me in contact with people. It's because of Larry Legend that I had my first interactions with Human Tornado and mm. and Leo Rush. Um, mm. Larry Legend was in fact also the ring announcer for Breed Combination Wrestling (BCW). Uh, in, in the beginnings of that company, a company that I did commentary with and got my first taste of, you know, doing things backstage, being, being a booker and being a production person and kind of producing shows and uh, working with talent, um, you know, on, on a more uh, administrative level backstage. Um, you know, but Larry, Larry taught me a lot, you know, uh, and in fact, Larry was the one who also opened doors for me in ring announcing because I've done a little bit of it all. I, I 
you know, I had a very yeah. Paul Heyman esque journey through the through the pro wrestling business when I first started. You know, I wanted to train, I wanted to to wrestle. Um, and while I did eventually get in a ring and take some bumps and, and learn some basics, uh, I never really had the time, just due to a, a lot of things that I was doing in my personal life, to really be able to train as full as I would have wanted to at at the time. And so I, I remember asking myself, what are some other ways that I can make you know, make an impact in the professional wrestling business. Uh, and it was, you know, well, I have a great voice. You know, I, I have training in radio. I have a background in radio and sports broadcasting. It's something that I wanted to do with my life. Uh, you know, commentary just seems like a natural fit. Um, but it wasn't always something that people had. You know, there was a time when NYWC didn't do live commentary. Yep. You know, their commentary was 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 post production. Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and so you know to get into places like that. In fact, the first time I ever worked for NYWC, um, you know, was doing ringside camera work. I was doing photos, not video recording, but I was doing photos. In fact, the night that I was there, I forget the date. I think it was probably about twenty. 14 maybe if i'm not mistaken uh 2015 it was the night that big o got put through the stage oh uh, yeah um, oh man i i remember that and uh and i was there taking ringside photography that night um you know and that was my kind of like entrance to nywc i i ring announced uh, an nywc show that they did in the firehouse um in long island yeah. you know uh, and this was at a time when, you know, Ryan Peterson was in and out sometimes as the ring announcer and, and things like that. But they didn't have their regular guys available. And they said, hey, do you, can you do it? And I said, sure. Um, you know, I've done some uh, SWA shows at the NYWC Sportatorium. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so th th I have a lot of respect and love for NYWC, that Long Island wrestling scene as well. You know, you mentioned guys like Pat Buck. I've, I've, I've crossed paths with Pat Buck four or five times in my life. Um, and each and every time I've learned something from him, I've had a great conversation with him, and I've gotten nothing but um, respect and, 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 uh, and, a, and, and good advice from him. In fact, uh, the first ever pro wrestling open house that I went to was over here in Rahway, New Jersey. Uh, at the at the Wrestle Pro facility, right before they turned into Wrestle Pro, they were still at the time Pro Wrestling Syndicate. Mm, yeah. um, you know, but you know, Larry was Larry was a constant on the independent scene when I was coming up because I, I I broke into the independent scene around late 2012 into early 2013, um, and he was just a constant everywhere you went. Um, he was ring announcing somewhere, doing something. Um, and, you know, just if it wasn't for Larry extending his hand to me and, and giving me the advice that he gave me, I don't know if I get to some of the places that I get to. I don't know if some of the doors open for me. Uh, in fact, it's because of Larry Legend that I first met Carrie Silken um, and, and first um, w was able to uh, associate and, and, uh, and meet some people in Ring of Honor during that time. Um, it's because of Larry Legend that I was able to get uh, into certain places and into certain doors that may not have been open to me at that time, but Larry vouching for me um, and, and Larry putting me in contact with people um, was was a major thing. Um, so I, I, I do owe a lot to Larry to to where I'm at now. And every time I do see him, and I mean, I haven't seen him in about a year or so, but every time I do see him, there's always nothing but hug and love and the, how you doing, what you've been up to, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I always wish Larry the best because, uh, you know, you know, you, there may be people in your past that may not be the best people later on in your future, but you can't forget what they did for you. And, and that to me is, is the biggest thing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Larry, uh, at the, at the uh, time, was uh, my best friend in the you know within within the business. Uh, he would come in to uh, Jamaica Station. I would pick him up, and then we'd go out to uh, 
wh- whatever show uh, you know, we were doing, you know, whether it was uh, you know, kickboxing or MMA or uh, pro wrestling, uh, you know, I, I can't remember how it exactly came to be, but Larry vouching for me, wanting me you know, next to him, you know, being the, the timekeeper, even though, you know, the timekeeper doesn't exactly have the utmost uh, profound effect on the match. It's still, it's still very much uh, something. And then after, you know, I drive him home uh, to the Bronx. Some days I'd have uh, 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 Pinky Sanchez in the back seat as well, uh, and uh, and Marty Bell too. Um, but yeah, Larry uh, still uh, one of the greats of the business. All right, oh, Marty. But you you mentioned Marty Bell, man. Yeah. Uh, Marty, Marty's such a sweetheart of a person. Uh, and I, I do wish she was out here more often. I, you know, she's a she's a New York girl, um, and, I, and I do wish she was out here uh, more often. I know I got to work with her once, bringing her in when I was um, working on the on the booking side of Recombination Wrestling, and we did a uh, Queen of the North show, which was an all women's wrestling uh, wrestling event, and we were able to bring Marty back in, which was really really great. Um, but I know Marty enjoys her time coming back to New York every single time. I believe she's out in. Kansas City nowadays, um, but you know there, there, there definitely needs to be more of a, a Marty Bell in New York because um, I know she absolutely loves coming out here, and it's always good to see uh, to see people like like her still active too, which is really great. Now, yes. um, we have stopped. Let's uh, you know, Rob Kiljoy is the grand champion, um, and you you have mentioned in the past that's going to be an intergender uh, title. Uh, women can keep yes. it as well. Um, it does beg the question: When are we going to get tag team titles? So um, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Uh, <laughs> but there will be an announcement regarding tag team championships on February second. At don't call it a comeback. There will be an announcement regarding those tag team titles. So we we are. Kind of on the same page there, James. Um, you know, we were able to establish the grand championship, get that done, and so the next thing on our list is a uh, tag team championship, which will also be intergender. It's going to be very key to know every single championship in We Are Wrestling will be an intergender title. It's why, while we will have a women's division, we will not have a women's championship. Uh, We will have all of our titles intergender to be held by men or women. Um, You know, we want to make sure that, you know, it's the best matchup, regardless of gender. And, I mean, your shows have been, you know, very pro, um, you know, intergender wrestling, um, which, you know, a lot of promotions, you know, they kind of go either side with it, which is, you know, it's fine. You know, it's it's actually something that I'm uh, a little sad about with this show. Uh, we, we, we don't have as many women on the show as I would like. I usually like a lot more, um, you know, women's wrestling or intergender wrestling on the show. Um, you know, yeah, Ruthless Lala will be there and Sammy Chaos will be there, but it's not as much as we usually like. Um, and, and, you know, the, the hardest part is, you know, um, the women are in high demand, right? It, it, it's very hard. Uh, to, to really put together some of the matchups that we've been looking to put together just because of availability um, or even just on our end budget. Uh, I'll be very honest. We There were a couple of people that we looked into for the February 2nd show um, that just unfortunately on our end, our budget did not lend, for this show specifically, did not lend to us being able to bring those talent in. But we are in continued conversations with a lot of those talent about bringing them in on later shows when we might have uh, what we will have, I don't say might, but we will have a a much different, um, but less budgetary restrictions. Um, You know, but definitely that's something that we want to do. I mean, the main event of our last show, Deja Vu, Ruthless Lala versus Mercedes Martinez. The main Uh event of our very first show, uh, Darius Carter versus Trisha Dora. 
in one of the best matches you're ever going to see. Like, listen, if you look at some of our main events, if you look at some of the matches that have gotten some of the top billing on our shows, Gary's Carter, Trisha Dora. Trisha Dora versus O'Shea Edwards. Masha Slamovich versus Mercedes Martinez. Oh, yeah. Janai Kai versus Tristan Ty. Janai Kai versus Speedball Mike Bailey. Uh, Ruthless Lala versus Mercedes Martinez. And that's just some of the women's matches that we've done. We've had Janai Kai in, in scrambles matches. We've had Trisha Dora. We've had Jordan Blade versus Savannah Evans. We've had Savannah Evans versus Karen Bam Bam. Like, what we're trying to do with the women's division is not only build a beautiful and incredible women's division on its own where you're going to see women wrestlers against women wrestlers, but building an incredible intergender company where whether you are identify as a male, identify as female, identify as non-binary, um, you know, however your identification is, it doesn't matter to us, right? It matters to us in terms of respect, obviously, but it doesn't matter to us in terms of, oh, just because you identify as this, you're only going to wrestle people who identify as this. No, we want the best matchups, regardless of gender, regardless of anything. It, it, we want to put on the best matches. And that's why to me, when we had the opportunity to do Janai Kai versus Speedball Mike Bailey, I jumped at that opportunity uh, with, with haste. I was like, whatever we can do to make that happen, I want to make that happen. Uh, and, then, and this goes across the board. When we did uh, Trisha Dora versus you know, uh, Darius Carter or even Trisha Dora and O'Shea Edwards. Like, you might look at those matches on paper and be like, what? And then realize they were some of the best matches that we've put on. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you're not going to get any complaints between uh, Janai Kai versus Speedball Mike Bailey. That's a banger. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of those, it's like it's a banger on paper and then it's a banger in real life. Yes. All right, um, Scooter, you have a question. Yes. Uh, now, uh, Don't Call It a Comeback is uh, presented by Victory Pro Wrestling. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that's the same BPW that's out in Center Reach. Correct, yes. Okay. Uh, my, na my nephew used to uh, work for them uh, as... as uh, Ring crew. Actually, uh, yeah, since uh, two weeks or so ago, um, I just I just figured uh, there there's an interesting story there. How 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 do you go about getting one promotion to agree to put their name on an event that? they're not hosting. Uh, well, in all senses of the word, Victory Pro Wrestling is, is hosting it. And I'll, and I'll break it down. So um, the New York New York City pro wrestling scene, and not only New York City, New York State, is uh, overseen by the New York State Athletic Commission. Athletic Commission. And, um, you know, the New York State Athletic Commission requires certain things to be in order in order for a professional wrestling event uh, to be presented. Right, uh, yeah. and that it requires a a up to date professional wrestling promoter's license, uh, insurance, uh, an ambulance, a doctor, all of these different things. Um, and so, Victory Pro Wrestling, we are actually acting almost to a degree as a subsidiary of Victory Pro Wrestling. Pro, Victory, uh, Victory Pro Wrestling is actually the one presenting our event. Um, it is the Victory Pro license that is being utilized for the event. Ah. Um, and Victory Pro Wrestling is essentially the ones handling everything. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, Victory Pro Wrestling ends up paying everybody. Victory Pro Wrestling ends up doing all of those things. Um, and, you know, we are really at the at the behest of, of them. So, um, you know, the owners of Victory Pro Wrestling have been kind enough to help us be able to do shows under their umbrella and under their banner in order to grow our brand until we can get to a point where we can apply and get a New York State promoter's license ourselves and then be able to present our own shows under our own 
uh, under our own license. Um, you know, NYWC has done this for countless wrestling promotions over the years, yes. has helped get them established and said, hey, we will present your shows. Um, and, and Shane and Curse are always there. And, and um, one of the things that I love about what, and you know, Shane and Curse, when they, when they do this for wrestling promotions themselves, is they're not only there to be the people that run it, right? Because that's their job as the presenting organization to be the people that essentially run the entire thing from point A to point B on the day of the show. But they are there and they are available to the promoter or the owner of the company of which they are presenting to answer questions, to give guidance. And for me, when I was coming up in the business, and I would be working commentary uh, for shows that were being presented by NYWC. One of the best things that I would love to do is always be around Shane and Curse and ask them questions. Hey, how is this done? How does this get done? What happens here? What occurs if this happens? Boom, boom, all these different things. Because they were hmm. always available to answer those kinds of questions. And it's because of people like Shane and Curse that there are a lot of promoters that are in better positions than they were when they first entered the business because they were able to learn those tips and tricks from people like Shane and Curse. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people who just do it for the money. Like, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll help you get your show off the ground and stuff like that. You'll do it under us. But you don't really learn anything, right? Uh, we're lucky with the owners of BPW that we're able to do the same things. We're able to learn from them. We're able to ask them questions. We're able to ask them for advice. Uh, we're able to, you know, learn from them presenting us so that the day when we're presenting ourselves uh, in, in under our own license, we're able to do it following in the footsteps of those who, who were able to help us get better. Uh, it sounds like, uh, Shane has uh, really matured uh, since the last time I spoke to him because every time I asked him a question, I get brushed off. Or something Shane is very infamous for is uh, breaking wind. The man, ooh, <laughs> I love Shane. God. Shane is uh, yeah. Shane. Shane is fantastic. Uh, you know, listen. I know that Shane was always one of those people where. You know, it, it took some getting to know him to really yes. get past that outer layer. And, and, and that comes with just being involved in the pro wrestling business for so long, right? You don't, you don't know who really is trying to learn, who's really trying to be genuine, who's really, you know, you, you know the term, you know, you don't know who's trying to work you, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. every, everything, you know, we, we have a lot of these kind of, brother brother situations and then you get worked in the in, in the end and you're the one holding the bag um and 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 with shane it was always and, and curse is very similar as well where it was a lot of they need to know you're for real they need to see that consistency they need to see that honesty they need to know that you are for real right um because even when i wanted to get shots at nywc coming up in this business it was always like, uh, we don't know, show up. You know, because they know a lot of people would ask, hey, show up. I know that to work for my WCA, I should say, but the minute they said, hey, show up, right, with no guarantee of anything, the question was, how bad do you want this? Are you willing to travel to Long Island on the guarantee of nothing and, you know, see if an opportunity is available for you. Are you willing to take the small opportunities and parlay it into something? And I remember the first time that Shane and John told me, yeah, just show up, we'll see what happens. And I showed up. And I remember John looked at me as I walked into the building and I went up to John, I shook my hand, shook his hand, I shook Shane's hand, I went to go shake the hand of some other people that were right outside inside the sportatorium. And I remember looking at John and he just looks at me and he goes, and nods his head. And that was that moment where he was just like, all right, you weren't just all talk. And, in, and, you know, listen, in the time that Shane and John have been around, they've met a lot of people who were just that all talk. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And 
one more name I think we have to include in that before uh, I throw it back to James is Crusher Dugan. Dugan oh, yeah. In the, in the same vein of Shane and, and Curse. Uh, and uh, we, we still miss him very, very much. Rest in paradise, uh, Dugan. Yes, uh, one of the yeah. sweetest men you'll ever meet. If you when, when, Once he lets you in, one of the sweetest men. But he was he was always there with a kind word, always there with something, you know, to say to somebody to help them, and, and never came across as – I've seen Crusher be upset at people and still come across, and you wouldn't know it. But, you know, Crusher – Crusher at the same time was one of those guys who, when he needed to give tough love, he gave tough love. But it was all from a, it was always coming from a great place. Yep. Uh, all right. James, throw it back. Yes. What is something you know now about promoting that you wish you did know when you first started promoting? How broke I was gonna be. No, just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I resemble that remark. Right. <laughs> um, no, I think it's um, how hard it would be to separate the friends you've made in the wrestling business from your your plans for the company. Okay. Um, you know, wh- by the time I got into even just being a, a part of, you know, a booking team when I was at a uh, Brie Combination Wrestling, my time there, you know, one of the, one of the first things that happens is obviously the friends you've made along the way, the people, you know, the people you've traveled with or the people you've uh, worked on shows with. Once they know, hey, you know, they've got somebody that they know on, on the inside, it becomes that, hey, brother, you know, you think you can get me a book in? Hey, brother, you think you can, you know, get me on the show? Like, hey, when are you going to book me? Things like that. And it's tough, especially when you're close with these people, when you're friends with these people, to not want to put your friends on and, and give your friends opportunities and get your friends you know, into those spaces. And, you know, you have to learn how to realize, you have to realize when is that beneficial for both parties and when is it beneficial just for them? Right. Right. Um, and, and, And unfortunately, I think one of the hardest things that has come with running a company uh, or being someone that makes booking decisions at another company or even my own company is how many friendships get frayed or kind of, you know, just disappear simply because it's like, oh, well, you don't book me. Oh, you don't this, you don't that. And it, it's tough because it hurts. Because these are people that you that you like, that you respect. Some of them that you've known for years. You've crossed paths with them. You know they're good. But there's only a limited amount of spots on a show. There's only <laughs> a limited amount of money in my pocket. <laughs> right. um, you know, uh, there's only a... Li- Listen, I could book a six-hour show. Spend ten thousand uh, dollars, and, and what happens? I make no money back. Um, the show, everyone hates the show, um, and then I come back the next time, and it's the same things, right? It's like, well, what are we doing new? What are we doing fresh? What are we doing different, right? And and I think that was that was the hardest thing to learn, is how to say no to people especially when you do a respect for them, when you do love them, when you do have friendships with them and connections with them to say, Hey, I don't have a spot for you and, and hope that it, that they understand, right? Hope that they understand. It's not that I don't like you. It's not that you're not my friend. It's not that you're not somebody that I respect. It's not that I don't think you're good. 
it's about, and, and this is something that I'm very big at, and anybody who's ever worked for me has had this, has heard this come out of my mouth to them. How are we going to use you in a productive way that highlights what you do and do you fit the spot that we need? Am I going to go and book a guy who's killing it on the indie scene, who's a good friend of mine, um, who's coming in from out of state to just be another guy in a scramble match? Does that really do anything for them? Does that do anything for me? Right? Am, am I, why am I going to pay, you know, X amount of money for someone who I'm not going to get that amount of value out of in the position that they're going to be in? Right. And I want to be able to maximize their value and be able to maximize the value that we're putting into bringing them in. You know, for example, if Wrestler X is going to cost me $300 to bring in versus with, with their travel and their booking fee and all that other stuff. Are we giving them an opportunity to be worth that or more? And are we getting an opportunity where we're using them that they are worth that to us? And that's the hardest thing. I think that's hard, that's hard sometimes for that for that thing to happen, right? It's like, I can book you and go over budget and then waste you. Or I can bring you in and with whatever your price is, I'm not saying that people's prices are too much, right? But like, I can bring you in and put you in a position that's going to be worth it to both you and to us. Am I going to bring in right now in January, February, March of 2023. Am I going to bring in someone like Janai Kai just so they can be the fourth entrant in a scramble match? Probably not. Right. Because right? if I'm going to bring in someone like a Janai Kai, if I'm going to bring in somebody like a Darius Carter, like a Trisha Dora, you know, and that list goes on and on, am I bringing them into an opportunity that is worth their while? that is worth their resume and that is worth it for us. And that becomes tough when you make all these connections in the wrestling business of, of, of having to tell people, I don't have a spot for you right now. I'm going to try to have a spot for you at some time down the line, but I don't have a spot for you right now. And for it not to be taken as a, as a, as, as a personal thing or a sign of, you know, disrespect or, a, you know, the friendship is no longer a friendship. Um, and that's been the hardest thing to learn is just like, how can we be friends, but also like, you need to understand how we have to operate as a business. Okay. Uh, Spiro, you have a question. Yes. What was it, what was going through your mind the first time you sat down to commentate a match. First time I ever commentated a match was at Five Borough Wrestling, which ran out of, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and big ups to Troy Thompson um, and PJ Stackpole and Mike Verna, the, the team that made Five Borough Wrestling uh, what it was, and uh, always grateful to them for giving me the opportunities and commentary. Um, first time I sat to call a match, I called the entirety of the show where Mike Verna won the Five Borough Wrestling Heavyweight Championship. And I remember that I was nervous as all hell because the reason why I got that position was... Uh, the person who was supposed to be calling commentary that night couldn't make it. And the usual person that was their partner um, also couldn't make it. And so that person, AJ Pan, who currently uh, does uh, agent work and commentary work for a bunch of different companies, is America's favorite agent, um, AJ Pan. Uh, he put in a good word with Troy Thompson. And said, hey, Pete, you know, he's been doing some of our uh, photo work. 
Uh, Pete's been looking for an opportunity to do commentary. He's pretty good. You know, can you give him a shot? And so AJ reached out to me and he said, hey, listen, I can't be there tonight. Uh, So-and-so can't be there tonight. I forget who it was, the other person that did commentary there. Troy's going to give you a shot tonight to do commentary. Uh, don't don't F up. <laughs> and I said, all right. All right, cool. Now, mind you, I had not been preparing. I didn't have notes. Um, I had not been, like, resting my voice to be ready for commentary. And I was told that I'm gonna have, I was going to have a partner. Somebody else was going to be coming in, and they were going to be my partner for the night. And that if all went well, possibly I would be a, you know, a regular guy on the, on the Five Borough uh, commentary team. And um, that night, I ended up doing commentary by myself. Because the, the, backup, uh, the backup partner couldn't show up either. So I did commentary by myself and lost my voice by the time we got to the main event. Oh, no. <laughs> and was summoning everything that I could to try to make sure that the call for that main event, the title match, didn't sound like crap. Um, I actually have heard the call from that title match years later. And I was like, oh, my God. I was squeaking. You could hear my voice breaking. You knew that I was just pulling at anything I had left. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful that my voice miraculously was able to, you know, pop back in uh, when Mike Verna won that world championship. And I was able to give him a, a proper, oh, my God, Mike Verna's finally done it. You know, uh, and then my voice died again. Um, and, and from that moment on, I was the, uh, the, the main guy at Five Row Wrestling, um, you know, and I was able to call the rest of Five Row Wrestling shows all the way to their very end. Um, I called uh, the very last show for Five Row Wrestling um, in Brooklyn, New York. And, um, you know, from there, I was able to take what I did at Five Row Wrestling and really continue to grow. I got opportunities at, um, you know, a bunch of different companies because of that night. Um, because of the nights that I worked for Five Borough. That, that is awesome. I really wish I could have gone into uh, you know, commentary, given uh, some, you know, something I'll uh, explain a little bit later. Uh, and who knows? Maybe it's not too late. All right, uh, James. Yeah. Go right back. So, you know, doing commentary, you know, as long as you have, like, in all of the matches that you commentated, is there a match or moment during commentary where you kind of maybe switched back to a fan and just kind of took in that moment like, wow, I'm here experiencing this? Um, there's a lot of times, actually, that that's happened, um, you know, where you, you just realize, like, Oh man, like this is uh, the night that I got to call Shelton Benjamin versus uh, Mike Orlando for, for Brie Combination Wrestling was an incredible night. Just, you know, telling myself, I'm going to call a Shelton Benjamin match. Like, what is life right now? <laughs> um, the, the night that, um, you know, uh, the night that I, I called my first ever Mercedes Martinez match. Um, the night I called my first ever Lufisto match. Mm. Um, just moments that, you know, are surreal. And, and sometimes watching matches that are just, you know, not even with anybody that at that time, right, is this, you know, massive name. So I'll give you an, an idea. Um, and there was a time in, in Brie Combination Wrestling where uh, Azriel was the world champion. Mm -hmm. um, and Azriel was scheduled to face Sean Carr uh, defending his BCW World Heavyweight Championship. And unfortunately, a couple of weeks before the event, Sean Carr suffered a leg injury that required him to be on the shelf for an extended amount of time. 
and would not be able to participate in that match. And literally, I think a couple of days later, I get a message from a young man who was just really kind of starting to make waves. And he offered to come in and fill the spot. And uh, I pitched it to our owner. And he was like, all right, make it happen. That night, calling commentary for that match was one of the most incredible matches that I'd seen. This young man who I'd seen wrestle two or three times at that point uh, we'd been wrestling for a little while, but I only seen him wrestle live two or three times. Put on one of the most incredible matches that I've, I've watched, and I'm and I'm calling it. And there are many times that I had to stop myself from getting lost in the awesomeness of the match, and and be able to call it. And that match was Azriel versus a young Richard Holiday, mm-hmm. and Richard Holiday took Azriel to the app. Salute limit that night, and I remember going to Richard Holiday that that evening after the show and said, "Man, you're going places." You know, the fact that I I now get to look back and realize that um, you know, I called very early MJF matches. I called mm-hmm. very early Max Caster matches. Um, I called very early uh, Iron Savages matches when they were known as Bear Country. Uh uh-huh. um, you know, the fact that I've gotten to call matches with people like Bull James, Mike Verna, the Big O, uh King Mega. Oh um, my god. Yes. Oh, you know, these are the type of, of people that I, I grew up watching. Uh the fact that I now get to, you know, call matches of people like Ghost Shadow and Dan Moff. The first day, the first night I ever called a homicide match, um, was absolutely I- incredible to me. Um, you know, these are the nights on commentary where I'm sitting there like, am I really getting to do this right now? Like, I'm, I'm having this opportunity. Um, you know, and and just on our very last show, Deja Vu, the fact that I got to call a match. And uh, my commentary partner, one of my commentary partners, Alphonse Stevens, um, I was able to somewhat keep it together. Alphonse was having a bit of a moment, which I loved. I loved being able to see that because I was feeling it too. The fact that we got to call a match with George South. Oh, uh, Darius Carter versus George South. At Deja Vu, we are wrestling presents Deja Vu, which you can see on title match. Um, you know, the fact that I'm sitting at a commentary table calling a match and George South is in the match. It's like, what's what's going on? You know, and, I, and I've got to do that with so many people that I now get to watch on television. Right? I get to see Joe Gacy on television knowing that I called Joe Gacy's matches on the independence. I get to watch MJF be the longest reigning AEW world heavyweight champion. Knowing that I called so many of his matches at Five Borough Wrestling, at Bree Combination Wrestling, at all these different companies when he was making his name coming out of Creator Pro. Watching Chris Statlander on AEW knowing that I called some of her early matches when she was coming out of Creator Pro, you know, um, and getting mad at Excalibur <laughs> for saying that he That's... was MJS first ever commentary partner. When in fact, uh... no, he was not. I was MJS first ever <laughs> commentary partner. And I have the pictures to prove it. Uh, you know, I have in, in this closet behind me, I have MJF's first ever wrestling shirt. Wow. Uh, and, 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 and Scooter, you may know this, James, you may know this as well. He was always MJF. Yes. But he wasn't always Maxwell, Jacob, Friedman. No. (laughs) And I have the shirt 
before the Freedmen. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And um, speaking of Excalibur, you know, there is a reason why his ha Twitter, Twitter handle is Shut Up Excalibur. <laughs> <laughs> I love Excalibur. I do. I mean, uh, when, I, when I think about, like, some of the more modern announcers, and I think about, you know, the, when I grew up on watching the indie, you know, you grew up watching PWG, you grew up watching, you know, all that, you know, super indie stuff, and you, you're hearing Excalibur's voice. You know, granted, Excalibur is my um, second favorite commentator on the Dynamite table um, because he's, he, he, Tony Schiavone is, is just a legend in my eyes. Uh, he's, he's, I would, I think there are, there are a couple of things I still want to be able to do in the world of commentary. Obviously I'd love to call commentary for a major contracted company, whether that's an MLW an AEW a WWE an NWA, things like that. I, I would love to be able to one day call commentary for a major contracted company. Um, but I think one of my biggest dreams in commentary would be to sit at a commentary table uh, with one of these four individuals. Tony Schiavone, Mike Tenay, hmm. yeah. uh, Mauro Ronaldo, hmm. and then it's a tie between Jim Ross or Michael Cole. Um, Granted, there are some people I'd also like to sit at a commentary table with. I've been lucky to sit at a commentary table with Kevin Kelly oh, uh, yeah. at an independent at an independent show here in New Jersey. Um, you know, it, it, to meet one of my idols, and to not only meet one of my idols, to learn from one of my idols, to sit down next to one of my idols uh, in, in Kevin Kelly was absolutely incredible. You know, there there are uh, announcers out there that I'm just like they they're they're Caprice Coleman does not get the kind of love that he should get for how good of a, of a commentator he is. Ian Riccoboni gets nowhere near the amount of love that he should get for how great of an announcer um, he is. People like Corey Graves is fantastic at, as a color commentator. Um, you know, I loved Renee Young's work, work on the commentary table. Um, there are a lot of great people out there, but if I'm thinking about my, my top four, to one day be able to sit at a table or even just learn from a Mike Tanay, a Tony Schiavone, a Jim Ross, a Michael Cole, um, you know, things like that, it'd be absolutely incredible. Well, um, I think that's a great segue into um, Pete's Bizarre Adventure. You're in the pro wrestling <laughs> world and weird, crazy, and bizarre things are bound to happen. Can you tell us a road story that fits that description? Oh, man, road story. Let me see. Oh, man. That's, I've been sworn to secrecy for some road stories. Uh, I, I, I'm not at the stage of my career yet where I can Ric Flair everything and just tell everything <laughs> and not get in trouble for anything. Uh, um, oh, man. Um, okay. One of the best uh, – a great road story um, – I got a, a very incredible opportunity uh, to be a part of WrestleCade in North Carolina, one of the biggest uh, pro wrestling conventions and shows uh, uh, held annually the weekend after Thanksgiving uh, from Friday to Sunday. Um, and uh, they used to do an, an event on Friday night called the Night of Champions. And they would open it to other promotions to – be able to defend their championships on Night of Champions at WrestleCade. And uh, we were able to secure a title match for Brie Combination Wrestling. And, um, you know, it's myself, uh, Azriel, Darius Carter, and AJ Pan in a car driving literally on, I'm on four hours of sleep. I think I pick everyone up around midnight Thanksgiving about midnight on the, on the Friday and drive down to North Carolina, to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Get there, get maybe a couple of hours of sleep, 
to get to the building and to prepare for this match. We are at this time, uh, we're Brie Combination Wrestling. We're barely three years in. Um, I think we're about two and a half years in at this point. Um, you know, our owner was unable to make it, unfortunately, um, due to some family commitments. So we're out here. We're like, man, don't nobody down here know us, right? We're on a card with Luchasaurus, uh, uh, you know, Lufisto, uh, Jessica Havoc. Like, there are a bunch of people, huge names on this card. And uh, we've got Darius Carter and Azria. Two guys that, unfortunately, outside of the Northeast bubble, their names are not as known as they should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just sit there and I'm like, guys, um, we got to kill this. And we go out there and, 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 and uh, these gentlemen have one of the best matches of the night because that's what Azriel and Darius Carter do. Um, and we get... We, they get to the back, and I'm sitting there, and my, my hand's still shaking. And uh, I remember a couple of people came up to them, and they said, hey, guys, you you guys did absolutely incredible. You da- you guys did did great. And, uh, you know, we spent the next night and a half having fun. I was drinking with Sinister Minister James Mitchell. Uh, though, though wow. listen, I, I, I missed out on the best spot. Okay, uh, you know, but you know, having great, great conversations with uh, James Mitchell, uh, having great conversations with Jerry Lynn. Oh, yeah. Um, getting to meet people like uh, then the man known as Eli Drake. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the man currently known as L.A. Knight uh, yeah. because, you know, yeah, dummy. Uh, <laughs> I do miss the dummy. I do miss the dummy button. Uh, but, uh, you know, getting to just, you know, associate with all these people. That was the first night I met Ruthless Lala, things like that. Um, you know, but to give you something maybe a little bit bigger, here's one. A couple of years into the wrestling business, uh, Scooter, I don't know if you remember this promotion called FWE. Yes. Uh, family, family wrestling entertainment. The one, uh. Uh, John Morrison was a part yes. of. Yes, yes. John Morrison, AJ Styles, the Young Bucks, PD Williams, uh, Sanjay Dutt. Uh, you know some of the bigger names that you would see to the Young Bucks almost all the time. Uh, and it, it, it's it, at FWE that I got really exposed to some of the best tri-state talent as well. I met people like the Colossal Mike Law, uh, then the man known as the Firebird, now the man known as the Inner City King. Jorge Santi. Um, mm. Men like, uh, it's where I first met uh, a man who's now a referee in the WWE. But Daniel Antibio. Uh, besides him, but I met <laughs> Bandito, uh, ba- uh, ba- Bandito, Bandito Jr., who now is uh, a referee under his real name, Eddie Orenjo, in the WWE. Mm. Um, but met, met people like him, watched him wrestle, with Jigsaw. Um, who was absolutely fantastic as well, as well as, and here's a tag team that I forever, 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 and indebted to for how great they were. The men known as um, Adrenaline Express, Eric James, and VSK. Okay. Oh man. And I, I knew them as Adrenaline Express when they were tag teams. They were a tag team in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, but I started out with FWE, and uh, one night they did a show in the uh, the casino in Queens, the Aqueduct Casino. Yeah. And it was a fantastic show. Matt Hart, London, Candice LeRae, um, you know, the, 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 the names go on and on. But one name in particular was on that show. The man known as Drew McIntyre. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, I met Drew one time previously, and we we had a, a conversation, and I knew that he was a uh, he he was a lover of cigars. So that night, 
uh, we all have this like little FWE after party in the bar in the uh, Aqueduct Casino. And I, I go up to Drew and I said, hey, I remember our conversation from last time. I brought you something. And I brought him a, I gave him a cigar and he looked at me and he was just like, so happy. I'm not even going to try to butcher his accent because um, I, I don't want Drew giving me a Claymore out of nowhere. Um, but Drew was so, so thankful. And me and him, we grab a drink at the bar. We're talking. We're having a good time. And uh, long story short, the, the, the best thing I could ever say in wrestling, Drew McIntyre for one night was my wingman. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it was the greatest thing in the world. It was the greatest thing in the world. Um, but I don't recommend it. I don't <laughs> recommend it, ladies and gentlemen, because Drew McIntyre as your wingman is still going to guarantee Drew McIntyre gets all the attention. <laughs> <laughs> no, no matter how good Drew McIntyre put me over, it was just like, but you, you're, you're big, and you, and you, you've got the muscles, and you've got the beard, and the hair, and the accent, and the. I don't care about him. Stop putting him over, Drew. <laughs> but uh, I'll forever be grateful for Drew McIntyre that night. Um, you know, Drew McIntyre did everything he could to try to to try to get me over. And uh, just unfortunately, uh, just 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 wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely um, yes. an interesting and incredible story to say the least. <laughs> it, it was a fun night. I was like, this has got to work somehow. <laughs> but no, but no, alas, alas, it did not. All right, um, Spittle, you have a question. Uh, first, I just have to mention. Azrael, great talent, great human being, too. Uh, one of the, and I hate to say this, but one of the uh, few people in the NYWC locker room who was, went way above and beyond in terms of being nice to me, showing me, you know, the ropes and whatnot, and, you know, putting up with me. Um, and... Do also have a. Uh, I had worked uh, the Battle of Brooklyn Impact versus Russell Pro uh, okay. on behalf of a uh, mobile uh, trivia app who was doing wrestling trivia and wrestling trivia, and we went and filmed Moose, Rich Swan, and a few others asking questions. Uh, I I figured I just had to mention that. No, it was a great show, actually. The only bad thing about that show was me trying to get home. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that's bad? Try coming, try living in the Bronx, and having to go all the way to Deer Park. Yeah. Yep. Work an NYWC show, and then have to drive back from Deer Park. I once I was so tired one night. I pulled over on the LIE. Um, and uh, put my put my hazards on and, and took a nap in my car and woke up to a uh, policeman rapping on my window asking if I was okay. And I had to prove that I wasn't drunk. I was just tired. Um, but that traffic, that traffic getting to Long Island sometimes when you're going to NYWC sure. can, can, be, can be something. Yeah. yeah. Between the clear view and around one... Uh, I don't know. No, and between... The 110, I would always take the Southern State um, most of the way. But Here's the best question. How much weight have you lost in sweat during the summer NYWC shows when, uh, when they can't open the gate in the back? Oh, God. Uh, that's – I'd probably say as much as I did when uh, we drove up to Camp Tioga and uh, – did a show for the campers there. Uh, it's on the uh, you know, uh, Binghamton, uh, you know, that New York, Pennsylvania border. Yeah. Um, and I had driven up with Ryan Rush, now Ryan Galeone, and Alex Reynolds, 
who only got in the car with me because they felt sorry for me because nobody wanted to drive up with me. Um, all right. Uh, okay, yes. Now, going from, you know, so many accomplishments uh, that you've done, I want to move on to Match Producer. And that probably one of the most uh, intense, hard-working positions of any wrestling show. Uh, yeah. If, you know, a lot of a lot of promotions are you know don't really have producers it's just left up to the wrestlers how the match goes and they just follow uh you know how the uh how the promoter wants the storyline to progress so tell us about being a match producer and the first match you produced and what was going through your head then and your favorite match that you produced uh but by no means am i uh <clears throat> am i am i super qualified match producer right I, I leave that to the agents and the match producers that you know have spent a lot more time in the ring uh than i have uh, you know but uh, I, i've always been able to understand if <laughs> while the physical side of wrestling was not something that came easy to me the psychological side of wrestling the the how you know it should look does things make sense all of that really kind of always came easy for me um to understand um and also just watching and learning from people putting together matches and things like that um and so when I was at BCW, I kind of started kind of dabbling in it, kind of especially working with younger talent, um, you know, learning from my veterans and going to my younger talent, like, what are we thinking of doing? What do we want to do? How do we want to get here? How do we want to get there? Uh, how do we make this look the way it needs to look? Um, and things like that. And then during the pandemic, uh, Isaiah Wolf reached out to me. Uh, he was doing a, a, a taping situation. And he wanted somebody to come in and help with producing matches um, and working with younger talent um, on how to really get what they wanted to get over. And that's kind of the biggest thing that, you know, younger talent struggle with is how do I not do too much? How do I get over what needs to gotten over effectively? Uh, and I think the word that we should be using a lot is efficacy in wrestling, what is the most efficacious way of being able to do this, right? We can do 12 things and it, and it happens, or we can do four and it, the same thing happens, but the four has more impact than the 12. Um, and so I really worked with a lot of the younger kids like, Hey, what are we thinking of doing here? What are your plans? Um, what are you putting together? What's, what's the finish look like, you know, and just working the psychology of a lot of these matches. Um, and that's really what it was, you know, um, a lot of it is just listening and learning from a lot of the veterans that I've been around. Um, you know, if you're a submission wrestler and your finish, your submission finishes an arm bar, why are you going to spend the match trying to attack the person's legs? Right. You're, yep. you're looking to weaken the arm, right? You're looking to weaken the arm for your arm bar. That's the whole point. It, it, it goes really back to some of those basic ideas of pro wrestling, right? What's To pull the curtain back a little bit, what's the business of the match, right? What's the business of this match? What are we trying to do? Um, you know, uh, and I think as professional wrestling has evolved into, you know, this very – mixed style of wrestling. You don't really have a lot of people that just do one thing anymore. Because when, when I was coming up, yeah. you had your brawlers, you had your technicians, you had your high flyers, you had your big men and big men wrestled like big men and high flyers wrestled like high flyers. You know, nowadays 
You've got 300-pound, 400-pound guys who can wrestle like cruiserweights, and you've got some of the smaller guys who do moves like some of the big guys. Right. Does yeah. it always work? No. But does it make putting matches together and, and, and trying to get outcomes uh, a little tougher? Yeah. Because, you know, you know, do, uh, uh, there's something that a, a bully Ray said uh, not too long ago in, in Busted Open um, where he said when he's coming into some of these independent companies to work with people, he's very big on how important the bump is. I'm not going to bump 20 times for you, kid. I'll bump once. But that one bump is going to mean everything. As he should. Yeah. Right. And and that's that's the thing, right? You know, you, you get a lot of kids who, especially a lot of these younger kids who want to come in, they want to they want to burn the house down. They want to give, they want to you know throw out every move they have. Oh, I got to get this in. I got to get that in. Let's take it here. Right. I, I come from a very old school mindset of professional wrestling where it's, where, how can we get the most effective way to get to the end and leave the fans wanting more, right? There are some people that I've worked with in professional wrestling where after I've seen one of their matches, I've seen every one of their matches. Right. Um, yeah. And that, that's, that's tough, right? Because if, if you're doing the same match all the time, and all of a sudden, I, as a fan, who should not have an idea of what's going to happen, knows exactly what's going to happen. I'm just sitting there, right? Um, you know, and I think the biggest thing that's tough for people to realize, especially, is something that Al Snow used to say when he's like, when, when that pop happens, go home. Yeah. Right. You're not going to get them any higher than that. Right. Right. So, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, and I was actually talking about this with one of our backstage producers for We Are Wrestling. You see a lot of veterans sometimes. You give them a match. Hey, guys, you got 12 minutes. 12. Ah, we'll do it at eight. <laughs> and there's a couple of a couple of people, especially some wrestlers, especially some younger wrestlers. Hey guys, you got 12 minutes. All right, we have to fill up every single one of those 12 minutes. No, 12 minutes doesn't mean you got to go 12 minutes. 12 minutes means you can go 12 minutes, but if you can get the business done in eight, and it's just as effective as getting it over in 12. That's even better. And one match that I always tell people to go watch. It was an NXT match. Back when NXT wasn't what it was now. And it was Brian, uh, Daniel Bryan versus William Regal. The match doesn't last more than three minutes. And Daniel Bryan gets more over in three minutes that if that match would have went 12. Do I want to see William Regal and Daniel Bryan for 12 minutes? Hell yes. Paul Heyman said this in a, uh, a Q&A that he did at Caroline's Comedy Club um, during Brock Lesnar, one of Brock Lesnar's runs, uh, talking about the Goldberg match. Somebody yeah. said... Who who else besides uh, he was asking the question of oh no this wasn't at Caroline's I'm sorry this was a uh, I think for uh, I forget the name of the the, the podcast or the um, Q and A company that does it they do a lot of the shoot interviews um, something ropes I forget their name the, uh, uh, from the UK um, in the ropes I, I think so but he was they were talking about the Goldberg match and the and the and the, the fact that Goldberg beat Brock in like 90 seconds. 86. <laughs> right. And he said, who else could have done that? And somebody in the crowd yelled out Samoa Joe. And Paul Heyman said, and I quote, I respectfully disagree with you because I wouldn't want to see 
Samoa Joe versus Brock Lesnar for 86 seconds. I'd want to see it for 86 minutes. Hmm. So does that take away from the fact that Samoa Joe and Brock Lesnar could have done fantastic business and Samoa Joe could have beaten Brock Lesnar in 86 seconds? Yeah. But would that have given you what you wanted out of it? Right. Right. And even if Brock Lesnar had beaten Samoa Joe in 86 seconds, would that have given you something where you're like, I want to see that again, right? And that's what Heyman was talking about when he talked about the Lesnar-Goldberg match. He said, we gave you just enough to make you go, oh, crap. But then in the very next breath say, I want to see that again. Right. And what and yeah. what happened? They came back to even more money later on, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the business of pro wrestling. You can go out there and you can have a twenty minute banger, but if I don't want to see it, did you leave me wanting to see more? Right? There was an uh, I think it was an eighty six minute match. I think it's still the longest women's match on record between Tessa Blanchard and Mercedes Martinez. And there were people who watched that match who said, I'd want to see 10 more minutes. How many matches have you two gentlemen watched that you've said, I don't want to see not a minute more. End it now, please. <laughs> right. Probably. Had they gone had they gone three minutes earlier? Had they gone four minutes earlier? Oh man, they would have left me wanting more. But that extra three minutes. That extra four minutes takes all the wind out the sails. Right. And so for me, when I when I got into producing, it was always just, I don't try to do what I don't know how to do. I'm not going to sit there and script out your match for you because I'm not the guy who spent time in the ring. I'm not the guy that has the extensive in-ring knowledge that's going to tell you this, 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 spot, 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 spot. But what I can tell you is that doesn't make sense. Why are you doing that? Why are you going from here to here to end up over here to come back over here? Why don't you just do this? Those smaller technical things is where my brain works. Yeah, I would I would probably say the whole three, four more minutes thing. I think would only apply to one match for me, and that was uh, that was IWA Punk and Chris Hero. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, the the yeah, they're the unwritten uh, guidelines, yeah, to uh, yeah indie promotion booking. Yeah, each match should focus on a specific limb. Uh, don't. Try not to repeat spots. Don't do the don't do back to back finishes of the same kind. Uh, that isn't pin. Yeah, it isn't a pinfall. Um, you know, and and, and and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, um, and I remember uh, calling the Brock Goldberg match on. Uh, on the remix, uh, my podcast, um, and I was calling it with uh, Sean Garmer of W two N Radio, and I re- I remember just screaming at the top of my lungs because I was so shocked. Yep, and it, it was just like oh, unbelievable. Yeah, and then and when they and when they announced they were going to do a rematch, not a single person said, "I don't want to see that again." Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and that and that's the thing, right? Because how many people going into that original match with Goldberg versus Brock was just like, "Why? Why are we doing this? Why do I have to see this? Oh my God!" And then by the end of that match, how many of those same people were like, I want a rematch. I want to see a rematch now. Yeah. 
And that's that's uh, the key. Yeah. Right. That's the key. Especially when you're talking about independent wrestling, because especially when you're talking about people who are traveling the country, right? How yeah. many times are you going to be able to work somebody, right? And especially nowadays when everything is out there, right? This isn't the territory days. This isn't the early 90s. Heck, this isn't even the early 2000s where you had to take trade, right? And you probably never saw the first time that these two had a match. You probably didn't know. If you weren't tape trading for JAPW, if you weren't tape trading ECW, if you weren't tape trading all these other places, you probably didn't know that those matches happened. Right. So when you saw them for the first time, it was like, oh, my God, this is great. But now if I do a match between wrestler A and wrestler B, and it's on IWTV or it's on Title Match or it's on Premiere or it's on Fight TV, wherever it is, everybody can see it now. Heck, if it's on YouTube, everybody can see it. And now what happens, I see that match in New York, and James is able to watch that match on YouTube. And now, guess what? James's local promotion is bringing in those two wrestlers. And they're going to fight at James's local promotion. And James is excited. And now James goes to the show and they do the exact same match that they did in New York. James has already seen that match. I would have. Yes. <laughs> How's that match any different? Right. Yeah. Again, it worked in the territory days. It worked in the early indies because James wasn't watching what was happening in New York. So when those two wrestlers went to California and performed at James's local promotion, oh my God, that's fantastic. Because he didn't know what happened in New York. And vice versa. But now this proliferation of everything, I think the biggest thing with independent wrestling is how can you make things fresh? When everybody is able to see everything, how do you make things fresh or different? It's kind of like the Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant. It was like first time ever yeah. WrestleMania three, and when it's been done, I think it was Shea Stadium, like Shea, Shea Stadium. Yep. Yeah, like uh, two years prior, but like only that, people yeah, knew fun. that it was Shea Stadium those years prior. But not, you know, the rest of the world that watched WrestleMania Dream. Right. Uh, there was a story that was told by Bruce Pritchard. I, I, I don't think you could find it anymore online. Uh, but he did a shoot interview where he talked about um, when the WWF started expanding into different territories. And they were coming into the, into the Texas area. And they said, hey... Here's WrestleMania 3. You can show whatever you want. You can show whatever match you want. You can show everything if you want. The goal was that they were going to do the rematch of Ricky Steamboat and Randy Savage in Texas. Well, of course, the, the people who were running the local promotions in Texas said, oh, man, you know, that macho, that macho steamboat match, that was, that was great. People, people would love to see that again. And so they put that on on their, on their television, and they showed the match in its entirety. And then a week later, they sat there and they said, what do we put on TV this week? And they said, man, you know. That macho steamboat match, that match was so good, I bet you people wouldn't mind seeing it again. And so for the second week in a row, they put that match on television. The whole match. Third week. You know, I don't think anybody will ever get tired of seeing that match. Let's put it on again. <laughs> so for the third week in a row, the Texas market is watching the same match from beginning to end. And guess what? In two weeks, the WWF is supposed to be coming to town. And guess what the main event is that they're going to give to Texas? Steamboat and Savage. 
that they've now seen four times. You killed the market for it. You know? Right. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, um, all right. Um, I believe it's time to yes. Uh, unless uh, you want me to ask uh, one more question, Matt? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And I swear this is going to be the last time asking about uh, commentary partners. I swear. Uh, you know, one thing that I think is really missing today is a true heel commentator. Yeah. And it's likely because there's only a few personalities that could actually pull it off and be convincing. Of course, you know, there's Bobby the Brain Heenan, um, you know, and, and, and Jerry Lawler before he, uh, you know, became a WWE legend. But there is one person that you have worked with that fits the idea of a heel commentator. And that, of course, is Joel Gertner. Yeah, I met Joel Gertner back at uh, Extreme Rising in uh, Corona. Um, absolutely great person. Great individual. Tell us about working with Joel G uh, Gertner as a uh, as a commentary team, and did he do anything different, or did he not stay in gimmick? Uh, no, I, and, and unfortunately, I only got to work with Gertner for one match. Um... But uh, Joel, Joel Gertner is one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. Um, and, and, and by the way, for anyone who's, who's wondering, that neck injury still bothers him to this day. Yeah. You know, the man can barely turn his head sometimes. It's, it, it's sad, you know, to know that that neck injury has lingered for so long with, with Gertner. Um, though he makes it look so fashionable. Um, yeah. But no, Gertner is Gertner's great, and you're right. The 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 heel announcer is missing. I think the closest thing we get to a heel announcer on television right now is a Corey Graves type. Um, you know, I think I, I think JBL is is kind of a bit of a, of a heel announcer as well. Um, but you know, Gertner is great because while his persona is very heel. Um, he, he, he knows how to do it well. And this is the one thing that's very hard to do when you're doing heel commentary. Heel commentary does not mean you bury the baby face. Right? Yeah. Um, you, don't, you don't go out there to make the baby face look like crap. And it's one something, it's something I had to learn when I first started doing heel commentary myself. When, you some of the, when we want you to be the heel color guy. Okay. Go out there. That baby face sucks. Blah, 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 blah. You know, um, and, and you kind of learn very, very quickly. You, you, when you bury the baby face, you're really burying the heel because if the baby face is terrible and the heel beats the baby face, well, how good really is the heel? You beat somebody who's a bag of crap. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and it was one of those things that you really kind of learn from watching some of the older ring announcers. When you, well, the commentators, you watch a Bobby Heenan, you watch a Larry Zabisco. You know, um, you know, when it was just like they didn't put over the baby face. They made the baby face. Hey, they would joke about them. They would put them down. They would they would belittle them, but they would never bury them. They would always say, you know, well, that guy could be good if he was just a little bit more like the heel. You know, they don't do this. They don't blah, 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 right. But they never, they never buried, they never made the baby face look terrible. And Gertner does a lot of the same things. And it's, it's very interesting when you listen to Gertner do commentary. Um, because there's that different era of Gertner. 
uh, which which is fantastic. And uh, uh, recently, over the last two years, year or so, I should say, I, I've kind of dabbled in a bit of uh, going back into a heel persona myself. And, and 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 people have said to me, they're like, dude, you do heel work so well. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't think I do great heel work. I think I do okay heel work. But I think it's also because there's not a lot of heel work out there. And everybody's so middle of the road. Um, you know, it, it's hard to do it because you kind of need to have a three-person booth. I'm a, I'm a very big believer of the play-by-play -play person should be neutral. The play-by-play -play person should never be a baby face or a heel. Okay. You know, their yeah. job is to tell the story and tell the business of the match. So if you're going to have a heel color person, you kind of have to have a baby face color person to kind of equal it out. And, and so a lot of places don't do, you know, a three person booth. And when you do a two person booth, you kind of get that, 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 you know, that hybrid play by play announcer where they're both a play by play and the baby face color. Right. Right. Um, you know, and, and it works. It works in some cases. Um, I actually like the dynamic that they have at Impact at TNA. Sorry, I don't want to get the rebrand wrong. Uh, you know, but I love the dynamic they have at TNA with with their commentary team right now, which I think is 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 really great. Um, and you look at even even AEW with their with their commentary uh, commentary uh, table. You know, you have your different guys. What you know, where I really think it was great. Obviously, the WWF days really great, and WWE has incredible commentary teams right now. Where I really loved the commentary dynamic was WCW. I always loved the WCW commentary dynamic because Mike Tanay was allowed to be your analyst. And he could handle the play-by-play -play beauties when Shivani needed to be a babyface. And when you had Zabisco being a heel, or when you had Bobby being a heel, you had opportunities for Shivani to be the babyface, and Tanay could handle play-by-play. -play. Or Tanay could be the babyface, and Shivani could handle play-by-play. -play. And you always had your heel persona there, and you didn't. It didn't seem like the dynamic was ever off. I always really loved the WCW uh, commentary setup, uh, whether it was Bischoff, whether it was Dusty, whether it was Zabisco, or whether it was Bobby. You know, you always had a great heel to move them, and for Tanay and Shivani to be able to fit into their roles perfectly. I feel like a lot of places it's hard to do that with a two-man team. I think Corey. And Michael Cole do a fantastic job. Um, Kevin uh, Kevin Patrick just comes across as a, as a beautiful baby face. So Corey and him work very well. Cole and, and, and Wade Barrett work very well together as well as the dynamic. But again, you really kind of don't have – like Wade isn't a heel's heel. He's still a heel, but he's kind of in the middle now uh, where Cole is your play-by-play -play guy. Yeah. And, and, so, and, and the same thing on, on Monday Night Raw where I – I would almost say Corey's a little bit more of a heel than Wade, but even Corey kind of plays the neutral quasi baby face every now and again. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good uh, time for the colossal question. Let's say that they're yes. making a movie about you. Every movie has a soundtrack. What would be the first three songs? on your movie soundtrack? First three songs on my movie soundtrack. All right. Um, this is, this is, this is tough. <laughs> this, uh, this is, uh, this is really tough. Um, I think it's because of one of, it's one of my favorite songs of all time is also a movie named after it. Um, but I would say uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by the legendary Queen. Um, even though technically, technically, this, I don't believe, I don't know if it's in a movie or not, 
but because it can relate it to a movie, I'm going to use a technicality to put it on the list. Um, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road by Elton John. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last one, I think one of the greatest movie songs of all time is I Don't Want to Miss a Thing by Aerosmith uh, from Armageddon. All right. A solid three picks, to say the least. All right. Um, now that we got the soundtrack down, then we go to writing the script, and then we go to casting. Who plays Pink? And you can't say yourself because you are obligated to make a Stanley-esque cameo. Oh, man. As long as I get to say Tony Stank, I'll be all right with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, who would play me? Um, I want somebody who's uh, so much better looking than me. So I would pick. It probably would be if I'm going with a current. So I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a current, and then I'm gonna give you like all time. Okay. Uh, current. It'd be a tie between Tom Holland or Timothy Chalamet. Okay. Um. I think all time, uh, oh man, all time, I would really love to be played by, I'd love to be played uh, by either Kevin Smith or Jack Black. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm a huge, a huge, huge, huge uh jack black guy but I, I will also say that um you know a, a a deep cut guy that i would really love uh to play me just because i would love to say that i was uh played by him would be uh brian o'halloran from clerks okay you even supposed to be here today uh, listen that is 90 percent of my life i'm not even supposed to be here today. Uh, and that, and there's actually sometimes I used to say that in wrestling sometimes. People used to be like, they look at me, I'm like, don't look at me, I didn't book that crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even supposed to be here today. All right. And every movie has a supporting cast. Who would be three people in your movie that's significant to you and your story, and who would play them? Oh, man. Um... Oh man, that's that's uh my mom. Uh and my mom would be played by her favorite actress of all time, Madonna. Okay. Um I would say that another significant person, I think if I had to pick one person um from my wrestling life, uh it would be AJ Pan, um, and he would be played by um, oh, man. AJ Pan would be played by Jeremy Piven. Okay, because um, he is the Ari Gold of professional wrestling. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, she has to play herself, but. Probably one of my biggest, one of the people that I've learned probably the most from in professional wrestling um, would be Mercedes Martinez. And the only person that can play Mercedes Martinez is uh, Mercedes Martinez. And I could not agree more with that. And I would not want to um, present her with somebody that would piss her off. And they could beat me up. <laughs> this is very true. I Listen, she, uh, she, mm -hmm. she, she. On most days, she loves me, and I still worry she might beat me up. <laughs> <Yeah. that? laughs> oh, boy. All right. Um, I mean, either way, it sounds like an incredible movie. I never knew I wanted Mercedes Martinez acting besides Madonna, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, well, my, mom, my, mom's favorite, my mom's favorite actress was Madonna, um, and uh, I mean, my mom's favorite singer was Madonna and everything. Um, so that would be, that would be absolutely uh, fantastic. I'd have to find a cameo role for uh, Mr. James Hetfield um, of Metallica <laughs> fame. 
Mm. Um, you know, if Jack Black's not playing me, Jack Black's playing somebody. <laughs> uh, uh, that that's good. That's definitely going to happen. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe if you know if if Jack Black's not playing me, I think Jack Black could play a great wrestler. We got to figure out somebody from my wrestling history that Jack Black could play. All right. While they're writing the script, you could pre-order the tickets now. And you just have to double check whether or not Mercedes has dropped her grudge against me. <laughs> um. All right. Um, on to a controversial subject. Pineapple on pizza. What's your stand? Hell no. Hell no. Uh, my girlfriend would get mad at me if she heard me say that because my girlfriend loves pineapple on pizza. <laughs> but I uh, am not a pineapple on pizza guy. But then again, I like weird stuff, right? I like um, I like ketchup on my white rice. Okay. So I, I'm, I, I'm Puerto Rican. So I grew up with beans. So it has to be beans on the rice. And if you serve me plain white rice, I need something to give it some flavor. So I put ketchup on my white rice. People think I'm weird, but I like ketchup on my white rice. So you can have your pineapples on your pizza. Leave me with my ketchup on my white rice. Okay. Hmm, fair enough. Do you have a spirit Pokemon? A spirit Pokemon? Yeah. Um... So in the mornings, it's Snorlax. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say, though, I think if I had a spirit Pokemon, uh, and because I am just a huge original 151 person, Hell yeah. uh, it, it would be, I guess, in my opinion, it would be a cross between... It'd be a, <laughs> uh, it'd be a cross between Psyduck, <laughs> uh, because most of the day I'm just like, what in the world is going on right now? I'm as confused as confused can be, um, and uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of of Squirtle Squad Squirtle, but specifically Squirtle Squad. Well, yeah, Psy because you know what the thing with the Squirtle Squad Squirtle was. He he had a chip on his shoulder. He had something to prove, right? Squirtle Squad Squirtle wanted to be wanted to be a part of the Squirtle Squad. That was his thing. But underneath all of that was a, a heart of gold, and, a, and you know, a lot like Charizard. You know, people always, you know, they they. I feel like Charizard gets a bad rap because everybody's like, "Oh, he's so selfish. He was so lazy." And I'm like, "Nah, he's just, you know, he's got a heart of gold underneath all of that." I mean, Charizard's come back to save Ash a couple of times. Oh yeah, you know. Psyduck. Oh, listen. Okay. Gold duck at heart. Psyduck in the brain. <laughs> <laughs> now, we love the late, great Tracy Smothers on the show. Do you know the acronym for Thug? T H U G. I do. I do. But, uh,. <laughs> You know, it's um, it's one of those things that uh, I always like to say, if you don't know, you don't know. But of course, Tracy Smothers is a thug, because who else could be that terrible from hell, that ugly, and go to jail? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all know a thug can't spell. <laughs> we love the late great Tracy Smothers, and we're trying to keep the memory alive on the show. Yeah, I uh, that is one shirt that I wish I had. I wish I had a Tracy Smothers shirt because that would have been absolutely fantastic. I do got to get me a Thug shirt one of these days, but uh, yeah, everybody knows a Thug can't spell. Come on, <laughs> I'm best I can look. <laughs> I need a Tracy Smothers short too. Yeah, the best. Tracy, Tracy Smothers, Tracy Smothers, uh, and, and I, I never got to work with Tracy Smothers, but um, everybody that I've ever worked with that has worked with Tracy Smothers has nothing but fantastic things to say about Tracy Smothers. Well, the best 
I can do right now is a shirt made by and sold to me by Damien Demento. Uh, we gotta get more of those in stock, the, uh, the Tracy Smother shirts. We need some cheap stuff, yes. Weirdest question you'll be asked on a wrestling interview. Um, would you ever consider uh, booking a rock? Not Dwayne Johnson, not the country. An actual physical rock on a We Are Wrestling show. You know, first off, this is the pro wrestling business, so you never say never. <laughs> uh, but in the words and in the spirit of one of my all time, of one of the all time greats and somebody that I look up to in terms of just his his mind about the business. Well, baby, all I ask is can that can that rock sell some tickets, baby? Can that rock draw, baby? Because if the rock can draw, I'm booking the rock, baby. Yeah. Okay. Can that rock sell? Can it sell, baby? Can it sell for me? I think it might. Um, yeah, so there you go. If that, if the rock could sell tickets, if the listen, I don't care what you are, who you are, whatever. If you can put a butt every seat, I don't care if you're a rock, the rock, a rock, the country, the movie. I don't <laughs> care. I'll book you. Well, just for context, there's this wrestler named Psycho Mike that did indeed wrestle a rock for over 15 minutes in a Princeton Man match. That's an Iron Man match that lasts for two weeks. Well, baby, listen, I don't understand. I don't know it, but about, baby, if it sold tickets, it's all I care. What was a... Uh, a cinematic match, so unfortunately during the pandemic, so unfortunately there was no, uh, you know, seats to be sold. Ah, missed opportunity. Maybe we booked the rematch. There you go. But, ah. but you know what I would do? You know, now that you got me thinking about booking a rock, <laughs> you know what I think? You know what I think is a match everybody wants to see. A match everybody's been waiting to see. A match we all need to see. You know what we should see? We should see the long-awaited triple threat match. Rock versus paper versus scissors. <laughs> I knew that was coming and I laughed anyway. <laughs> to the people of the Bronx, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, on a more serious Canadian. note, where do you see yourself in five years? With a lot more gray hairs than I have right now. No, um, I, I, that. In, in five years, man, uh, I'd like to see We Are Wrestling uh, thriving, running on a more – right now we run on about an every three-and-a-half-month schedule. I'd love to see us running every two to three months uh, regularly in the Bronx. Um, you know, I, I'd love to be able to, uh, you know – do some work with some great companies, whether it be on the independents or uh, contracted wrestling companies uh, in, in commentary. Um, you know, I listen, I'd love to say that I'd, I'd love to be working here. I'd love to be working there. You know, I, I, uh, I appreciate being able to work anywhere that gives me an opportunity to continue to grow my, my talent and then to, to apply my craft. Um, but my, my biggest hope I would say uh, is in five years, maybe I take a little time away uh, from being as active, because uh, my hope is in 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 five years I'm uh, you know I'm running around with uh with a little one trying to chase them around, and uh, you know I got no time to chase around wrestlers. Maybe I'll have a maybe I'll have a four year old, you know, running things that we are wrestling. Go go tell this person, hey, you, I'm not gonna tell you. Go tell that person they're they you know they're they're losing tonight. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you know who's gonna say no to the four year old? Um, <laughs> You know, but uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to a couple of things. Uh, you know, definitely in the next five years, looking forward to hopefully, uh, you know, if I'm so blessed to, you know, hopefully be a dad, and uh, you know, be able to uh, start looking at that next generation. Um, still hope to be working in professional wrestling. Still hope to be doing some great things. 
Um, I know there's a lot of things on the horizons for a lot of places that I'm either working in or you know, that I would love to work for. Um, <clears throat> and so really just looking forward at, a, you know, that next chapter of, of the wrestling career, whether it be for uh, Pete Rosado, the voice of generation, the commentator, or whether it be for Pete Rosado, the man behind the curtain uh, for We Are Wrestling. Um, but when it, when it comes to We Are Wrestling, just really, I, I want to build it in the, in the footsteps of the, those who came before me, right? When I look at, you know, the places that I've worked, Five Borough Wrestling, Battle Club Pro, um, you know, granted, uh, outside of the controversy that this company had, uh, the legacy tier one wrestling, you know, an FWE, places like that, places like an NYWC. I, I want to become an institution. I want to become what we are wrestling to become known as the place to go to, to see, uh, incredible pro wrestling in the Bronx. Um, and then who knows, maybe even take, we are wrestling on the road. And what is a match people should go out of their way to see that best shows off what We Are Wrestling is all about? Huh. Uh, we, we, we spoke about a couple of them earlier. Um, I would say uh, from our first show, want to be starting something. You definitely want to check out Darius Carter versus Trisha Dora. Uh, from, I'll, give you, I'll give you one from every show, actually. How about that? From our first show, Darius Carter versus Trisha Dora, and want to be starting something. In our second show, um, you know, it was all a dream. I would say there's really two matches on that show. The entire match, the entire show is incredible. But Brian Keith in his Northeast debut against Darius Carter, and uh, O'Shea Edwards versus Dan Moth for the first time ever. Uh, from our third show, One Step Closer, I would say uh, definitely go out of your way to check out Jay Lethal versus uh, Rob Killjoy. From Welcome to the Bronx, our first show in New York, our first show in the Bronx, definitely Janai Kai versus Speedball Mike Bailey. Um, also, the, we are, uh, the Welcome to the Bronx Rumble on that show really embodies uh, that a, a love letter to Bronx wrestling. Um, at There Can Only Be One, our, our heavyweight title tournament, I would definitely say to check out that match between Rob Killjoy and uh, Mr. Dan Moff in the semifinals of the We Are Wrestling Championship, Grand Championship Tournament. At our previous show, our last show, Deja Vu, um, Ruthless Lala versus Mercedes Martinez, um, or even Darius Carter versus George South. Uh, and on this upcoming show at uh, We Are Wrestling Rents, um, don't call it a comeback. I would definitely say we have a couple of matches. Darius Carter versus Ichiban. Jarrett Diaz versus Dustin Waller. Uh, Rob Killjoy versus O'Shea Edwards. Uh, these are the types of matches that we want to put on. This is the type of talent we want to uh, look into. You look at the uh, six-train scramble match as well. Uh, but yeah, there's a uh, matches on every show that that really embody the fabric of what we are wrestling is all about opportunity, giving um, you know talent that's not normally up in these areas, give them opportunities here, um, building young talent um, such as a Matt Awesome, a Jared Diaz, and Ichiban, things like that, and Anthony Gamble, uh, and also putting together those kind of like first time ever banger matches that people are like, Oh my God, I got to see that. Um, and what I want to do is I want to show that it can be done without always having to go get, you know, those super big names, right? right. We're doing it with on a smaller scale and we're still giving you some great matches with some great talent uh, from all over the independence. And uh, the link to your um, to the YouTube page, uh, We Are Wrestling, will be in the uh, description of the video below, but on YouTube and Castbox. Um, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure some of those matches you mentioned are on that YouTube page, correct? Yes, and we are still working on populating that new t uh, that YouTube page with some more matches. So we will be seeing more matches being put up there. Uh, but yes, I uh, believe the. Um, uh, I know for a fact the Mercedes Martinez La La match is up there and a couple of others as well. 
Alright, and I will put that, uh, I will put those matches in the description of the video below, both on YouTube and CastBox as well, for anybody that hasn't seen them, wants to see them, wants to re-see them after this interview. And since we are nearing the conclusion of this interview, we are wrestling with the eight questions of D. All right. Da, da, da. This is our speed round, our bonus round, the round where we see who you really are. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Excluding yourself, greatest wrestler of all time. Ric Flair. Worst wrestler. Nobody. Uh, Scooter, give him the default. Mm, by default, you have chosen Ava Marie. No, I like Ava Marie. Then why would you say she's the worst wrestler? <laughs> yep, I knew that was funny. You're booking the main event for WrestleMania for the World Championship. Who are the two combatants? Right now? Anybody, ever. Anybody. Currently wrestling. Um, past, present, future, living, dead. Okay, all okay, time. Um... World Championship all time. Uh, I'm going to book. <sighs> Crap. Now you're now you're giving me one because this is this is tough because there, there's some there's some title matches that I'd love to see. Um, you know what? I'm going to give us. I'm going to give us a, a world title match. That I think would have been absolutely incredible had it ever been able to happen. I'd like to see for the World Heavyweight Championship Brock Lesnar one on one against Bruiser Brody. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. I like it. If you could come out to anyone's entrance music, past or present, who would it be? The Four Horsemen, Arn Anderson's theme song, the Enforcer, baby, the, the default theme song for the Horsemen in WCW, baby, right there all day. Finish the sentence. K-Fabe is... K-Fabe is, is real. We also would have accepted is quite good on toast. Oh, yeah, it, is. it actually is. It is a little bit of jam. Squash, vegetable or fruit? Uh, a match on velocity. <laughs> I will accept that answer. <laughs> New Japan wrestler Tai Chi. His ring gear gets smaller every year, really morph himself to wolf. My question: What is the appropriate trunks to butt cheek ratio for ring gear? <sighs> Depends on the butt. Really depends on the butt, right? You know, I think if 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 if, if man or woman, right, man, woman, or, or otherwise gender non-conforming, non-binary, if the butt is button, you let the butt butt. <laughs> okay, you let the butt butt. I don't care who you are, man, woman, gender non-conforming, non-binary. If you got it. Flaunt it. And if you're not comfortable with flaunting it, then you can flaunt it in ring gear that covers it, then do that too. Okay. Let the butt butt. That is That's the right. You got to let the butt butt, baby. And the last question, the main event, the thing everybody wants to know. Have you ever had a conversation with a stranger in a supermarket about Darby Allen. You know, I think that may be one of those those missed those, those missed opportunities. Um, I, I don't think I have. I don't think I have. But 
I have had an incredible conversation with a 75-year-old lady on a New York City subway train about Sting, only to figure out as I was walking out of the train, she was talking about the singer and oh. I was talking <laughs> about the wrestler. Don't you just love being in the pro wrestling bubble? <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. And of course, that is the correct answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was great because I was like, I was like, oh my god, Sting is so awesome. I think I was I was uh, I was listening to something about um, they were talking about Sting, and I was like, Sting is so great. And this lady sitting next to me, she's like, he is, isn't he? I I can't believe he's been around for so long and he's still so great even now. And here I am, just thinking she's talking about Sting, the pro wrestler, not understanding this woman, seventy five years old, <laughs> and just talking about Sting, the lead singer. Yeah, she's watching Dynamite every Wednesday. <laughs> Listen, I, I I know she had a, a post of surfer sting in her in her in her, in her in her bedroom. Of course, that will conclude this interview. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this with us. Uh, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. It was, it was an absolute pleasure. And uh, Scooter Dust, whenever you yes. can make your way from Queens over to the Bronx, you know where to go. When he yes. figures out how to put his pants on, he'll, he'll make it. Yeah. <laughs> Please show up with pants. Pants are not optional. Though, again, if the butt is button. No, nobody wants to see that. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> but that actually said that's an answer to a question I was going to ask. So, hey. Once again, where can we find all things... Um, we are wrestling on social media and um, everything. Well, you can find all of our ticket sales on eventbrite.com. Just search up We Are Wrestling, our upcoming event in just a couple of days, February the 2nd, at St. Helena's Church in the Bronx, 1315 Olmstead Avenue. You can get there by train, by car. There will be parking at the venue. Tickets on sale right now at eventbrite.com. Just look up We Are Wrestling. And if you want to find us, on social media, on Twitter, wrestling underscore we, on Instagram, we are wrestling one, the number. You can also find, on, find us on Facebook at we are wrestling. There is an older page called we are wrestling. Make sure you're finding the most updated page with our logo right in the profile picture. And you can find me on, uh, on Twitter at Pete Rosado 87 and also on, on Facebook as well at Pete Rosado. Follow all things we are wrestling. Keep up to date because trust me, Big announcements coming on February 2nd, especially about our next show later this year. And you don't have to type it into your Google machines. All of the links to all uh, their social media. This is the correct answer. Uh, <laughs> um, all of the links to all of their social media will be in the description of the video below, but on YouTube and Castbox, simply click the link. A new tab will appear on whatever device you want on. Um, you have no excuse. Buy a damn ticket, and if you can't, watch the damn show. On Live on Title Match Wrestling Network. Of course, thank you for listening. If you like what we're doing, please like, subscribe, comment. But on YouTube, Castbox is sponsored by Rose Energy and Player One Coffee. Join us next Tuesday and Wednesday for new incredible interviews. Um, follow the show at Wrestling with E, both on um, X, Instagram, and Thread for information on who we're interviewing, when we're interviewing them, links to those interviews, and so much more. Follow me personally at JamesJ993, and where can we find Scooter? As always, find me on X at ScooterDust. And the next time the remix will come to you live, Elimination hopefully. Channel. Or Elimination Chamber uh, happening in Australia. Remember, the remix, the first and still only live alternate commentary podcast streaming live audio commentary. You got your choice. Choose your commentary. Ah, the remix. Keep, uh, keep your eye out to uh, social media's uh, for news on Elimination Chamber.
All right, uh, Pete, when I say wrestling wit, you say entertainment, okay? You got it. For always special guest Pete Rosado, Coleco Yacht, Scooter Dust, I'm James Jane. This has been Wrestling Wit Entertainment. Hey, folks, this is the Colossal Mike Law, and you are listening to Wrestling With Entertainment. Enjoy the show. Support these guys. We appreciate it very much. We'll see you at ringside.